couple weeks ago we were in the in chapter 12 and we were admonished that we have not come to Mount Zion to the city or we have come uh, to Mount Zion to the city of the living God the heavenly Jerusalem to myriads of angels to the general assembly in the church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven and to God the judge of all and to the spirits of righteous made perfect and to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant and to the sprinkled blood which speaks better than the blood of Abel in that song Janet you were singing that view of John's of revelation in the worship service that was there and Father we just we, we thank you first of all but we come before you and we acknowledge that we must lift our eyes above the level of this world we're supposed to see what's around us for sure and we're supposed to minister into that we're supposed to love it we're supposed to have patience we're supposed to see the gold and we're supposed to shed light where there's darkness but for ourselves deep from the core of us we have to know that we are called into the presence the heavenly presence the throne of God the angelic company the cloud of witnesses which is surrounding us on every side angels and cherubim and seraphim and other creatures of the heavenly realm that touch and influence our lives some of them some of them perhaps don't they're out there bringing glory to the father and wherever they are but we're not alone we're not just stuck on this the surface of this ball we're not subject to the whims of our culture our society or our political situation at the time we're not limited only to our physical existence and the frailty and vulnerability of it we don't have to establish meaning based only on what we can see and deduce from what we look around us there is great beauty there there is great joy there father's nature is reflected there and your power as creator is reflected there but Lord we can also draw deeply from the heavens we can draw deeply from the spiritual realm the permanent realm where that which we see is temporary and that's what we want to do Lord that's what you want us to do you want us to be people who don't rely upon having a city here but we're looking for that one whose builder and maker is God so we join Lord with Abraham and his vision of that we join with David as his eyes are turned to heaven we join with the prophet Isaiah as he sees a dawn a light rising over the darkness of the people and we pray Lord we pray because you've called us the light of the world and we know first you were declared to be that you've spoken your peace into our life not as the world gives and you've poured joy out on us that your own joy joy that caused you to endure the cross without problem and I know I say that and it sounds flippant Lord but there was never a moment on that cross where your victory was not assured even though the trial was very real so Lord we're caught up in that in this covenant you are our covenant partner you brought us before the father and bring us before the father blameless and above reproach and so we thank you for that. We thank you for being able to sing about the heavenly worship that is going on right this very moment to join in with it. We thank you for your kingdom. And we thank you that in all these things, by your grace and mercy and love for us, we are more than conquerors. So Lord, we bless you. Father, we bless you. Holy Spirit, we thank you for living in and with us. And the amazing job that you do connecting us with the heart of the Father and of the Son. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Thanks, Janet. Hi, everybody. Hey, Mary. Who? Oh, hey, Paul. Paul. I see your green line flashing. <laughs> Looking How are things up in Minneapolis? Uh, you know, they're um, in the natural kind of disturbing, but in the spirit realm, 
Everything is good. I think I have some news for you. Um, in a couple of weeks, this is an announcement for everybody. Sean Fogue, how do you say his name? Yeah. Fouch. Sean Fouch, he's a Bethel uh, worship leader, uh, young guy, long hair. He has taken worship outside, started there in California, but he's gone all over. He was the one that took the team up to uh, Portland and worshiped right there. He, uh, I think one of his first big excursions was to what was at the time CHOP or CHAZ or whatever it was. And they've, they've received a little bit of opposition here and there, but they've gone to a lot of different places. And um, I, th I think he's coming sometime within a week, I think, or less, uh, he's going to be up in the Fort Collins area. And then next Saturday at 10 a.m., he is going to be taking worship outside with Hold the Line at Memorial Park here in Colorado Springs. And so uh, we'll have more details about that and the um, ability to get involved. They weren't able, from what I understand, to get a permit to meet with a worship service. So uh, it's being done as a protest. So <laughs> next week we're going to make some signs and uh, stuff. And they've given some guidelines to try to help that be meaningful, but I think it's kind of fun. Anyway, it could be a, could be a, a good deal. It's going to be down in Memorial Park for a few hours, and uh, there's a lot of pastors in town, a lot of churches in, in the town that are going to be there. So I'm hoping that we can have a presence there. I'm looking forward to it. Just worship and carry our protest signs. So, Paul, <clears throat> that was our announcement here. I understand he's flying from Colorado Springs to Minneapolis. Oh, interesting. I think he was up here a while ago. Uh, um, he came up for, I believe, a day and led worship about a half a block from where George Floyd was killed. Mm. And, boy, that ruffled some feathers. Yeah. But you must feel the Lord is leading him back. And I, I, I think so. If the information I got on Wednesday when I was with the pastors is correct, he's going to be heading up your way. Nice. So yeah, That's wonderful. Think, and Elizabeth, I can't imagine it'll be long before he makes his way to, to Wisconsin. That would be my guess anyway, because he seems to enjoy getting to those places where there's need for worship. And as far as ruffling feathers, I didn't know demons had feathers. <laughs> That's just one of the manifestations they take. Yeah, it must be, must be the dodo. Anyway, praise God. So that's, yeah, that's going on here. And... Um, and that's about it. Also, I have some announcement about the thing going on in Uganda. We were able to match another $947. So uh, that turns out to be about $1,800 or $1,900, bucks, an, an additional. That is going toward the land payment. And uh, it looks like we're well on the way. People are, are chiming in. We're well on the way to getting that land paid off by the hopefully the end of September. So that'll be a big, big step forward. And... Pardon me? Yeah, completely paid off. Completely paid off and with the money for the registration fees to get the titles transferred and that kind of thing. So uh, the gentleman that owns it has been sick. He's out of the hospital. He's recovered. Um, he is a very uh, trusting guy in relationship with Joel and the people back there. Um, but his kids were a little skeptical about it. And there's things beginning to happen on the property with his permission, like surveying and some staking and that kind of stuff. And the kids were sort of nervous that are they really going to pay? So it was a, it's a cool thing that this weekend Joel's going to be able to take them 1800 bucks, and, uh, and get going. So that's going well, and Joyland's playing a neat role in that. I appreciate it. Um, Father, I just pray that you'd bless those that are giving, bless their finances, bless the jobs and the businesses, Lord. And we just extend this prayer as we're praying over this, these resources. Um, I was driving around town today, and I know there's been a lot of hardship with the restaurants and stuff, but it doesn't seem, I don't see a lot of boarded up or, or closed businesses. The place that we have breakfast regularly is still hanging in there and doing a, doing a good job. And so I thank you for the favor that's been over the communities up here in Woodland Park and here in Green Mountain Falls. Uh, Father, I know that there's some hardship going on down Colorado Springs, so I just pray for economic favor. And I also pray for wisdom for the leaders, uh, the, the governor and the health department, I know, I know, I know it's hard to roll back restrictions. But God, we pray for them that uh, with the same goodwill that they tighten things up and ask people to sacrifice, that they can also release that hold 
when it's not logical or doesn't make sense. And so I just pray for wisdom. I pray that you would visit Governor Polis in the night, that you would visit those that consult with him. I know it's a volatile time politically with an election coming in just 60 days. But uh, there are things more important than politics and bigger. Things of righteousness and of truth and of humanity. And so we pray for our leaders that we might live peaceable lives, profitable lives. We thank you for it, and I pray that you give them the courage to do what is right and to know it. Amen. Amen. Uh, well, good to see all you guys. We've got Florida, Wisconsin, California, Minnesota. Who else is up there that I don't like? Oh, yeah, that's right. Richard's in Kansas. Hey, Richard. Tess, you're in, in, uh, you're in St. Louis or Kansas City? Southern Arizona. Oh, you're in Southern Arizona. Okay. We must have I'm, got my wires crossed somewhere then. And there's Al. 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 Oh, there's Al. From, yeah. Okay, let's have a contest, Al. There's $100,000 at stake. Who zoomed in from the furthest away? <laughs> <laughs> We'll get it to you. <clears throat> we'll get it to you in Bitcoin. Bless you, brother. Bless you, brother. So I sent out a thing. I know some of you got it. I'm going to uh, introduce a, a new series a little bit. We're just going to transition from something we talked about last month. And I want, I want us to be ta uh, focusing our attention for a couple of weeks at least on knowing God, what it means to know God. Um, there's a deer right outside the door, two of them, a little baby. Yeah, they can come in if they want, probably give us all deer ticks or something. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's what we want. One of the things that has always mystified me uh, is that there are certain passages of Scripture that are just simply not given the weight that they deserve. And I'm going to read out of John here in just a little bit, but, but one of those passages is the one we're looking at tonight. So I've got to grab my... We'll deal and get this up. Let's see here. No, I hope the deer aren't coming in. We'll have to move them over. There should be a routine I can figure out how to do this. Maybe the deer will come for the fish on screen. They could. But that's why I got them off quick. <laughs> okay, so I want you guys to be ready here. I've got a short message today just to introduce this topic. As always, um, you're looking at something that seems pretty simple, but there's a lot in the scriptures about it. So we're going to start in John uh, chapter 17, Jesus' prayer to his Father. And this is where he makes one of those statements, like I mentioned a minute ago, that is um, so critical you wonder why there's not courses on it, why there's not books and stuff written about it. There's been a few. I know A.W. Tozer wrote a book about knowing God, and, and there's uh, Jaya Packer did too. But here's the verse. Jesus spoke these things, and lifting up his eyes to heaven, he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. Even as you gave him authority over all flesh, that to all whom you have given him, he may give eternal life. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you've sent. Now this last line here, the one down there in gold, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you've sent. Um, this explains basically what the objective of everybody in the whole world's Christianity is which is eternal life. And we have a tendency to think that, uh, you know, if we think in terms of heaven and hell and going to heaven and avoiding hell, then we are in a situation where that's our focus about eternal life, it getting to heaven. But what Jesus says here describes this target, this goal, and I don't think we spend very much time thinking about it. So we're going to at least spend, because I that's a couple weeks, because I've been known to focus on those things we don't try to spend a lot of time on, because I find them useful. Fascinating. So, 
back up to verse 2. Even as you gave him authority, uh, Jesus speaking about his father, about, his, about the son. Even as you gave him, it was confusing. Jesus speaking about his father, giving himself authority. Even as you gave him authority over all flesh, that to all whom you've given him, he may give eternal life. So the fruit of Jesus' authority is not primarily to establish the church. It's not primarily to uh, reign in, again, a kingdom for Israel. It's not primarily any of those things. It is primarily to give you and me eternal life, to engage us with eternal life, if give is the right word. I mean, that's what it says here, that he may give eternal life. And then he describes what it is, which is cool, because we wouldn't have any idea otherwise. We would probably think it's just living a long time or living after you die again or living in a good place, a happy place, a blissful place as opposed to a smoky, fiery, burning place. That's what a lot of people think. Um, This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you've sent. And so I want to look at the the constituent part of what eternal life is before we try to crystallize a definition about it so that we don't, we don't shoot for something that we don't know how we get to. Eternal life is knowing God. Knowing the Father, you could say, or maybe knowing God and Jesus whom he sent. Um, most people, I think... Uh, don't think so specifically about eternal life. And so, but I think all of us think about it. And so what I want you guys on Zoom to do and what I want you guys in the room to do is be prepared to come up here and uh, we might move the chairs down here since it's kind of a thin crowd. And uh, I want you to tell me and us and each other about knowing God. How do you experience knowing him? Okay, so you can be ready for that. This is eternal life, that they may know God. So, experiencing eternal life is the important thing about knowing God. Okay? What's the objective of knowing God? Well, what, how's that different than the important thing? Uh, for me, I, I sort of see the objective as being a goal we can look at or a target we can look at. Uh, eternal life is certainly that, but eternal life's not out there someplace. Eternal life is that which we experience as we know God. And so, this is out of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 8. And I think it's significant that it comes in 1 Corinthians. Because Paul says, I'm going to show you a more excellent way. And it's love. He was talking about a more excellent way over spiritual gifts and all that kind of stuff. Love is a more excellent way, and this is what follows the love chapter. Love never fails, but if there are gifts of prophecy, they will be done away with. If there are tongues, they will cease, and if there is knowledge, it will be done away with. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away with. When I was a child, I used to speak like a child and think like a child and reason like a child. But when I became a man, I did away with the childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now, that's the first parallel that I want to talk to you about. We talked about it a little bit on Tuesday, so it'll be a repeat for Sonny and Ronnie. But um, for now we see in a mirror dimly. If you didn't know what the second half of the verse said, what would you expect the contrast to be? Would it be something like, but then we will see clearly? Or then we will see the image more brightly? But what it says is, now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. This is a relational comparison, not an illumination comparison. It's a relational comparison. Look at the next one. For now we see a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully. Now that makes sense. I knew a part of the thing, and now I know the whole thing. But look at the explanation. Just as I also have been fully known. There's the relationship in the thing again. So one thing I want to present to you to think about is that eternal life is not just long life, and it's not just after life. It is relational life. It is face-to-face life. It is face-to-face life. It is life not only face-to-face, 
but life being known fully. Okay? So there's a bunch of no's here, and this is mostly for Ronnie. He and I have been talking about Gnosko for a while. So for we know, all of these are Gnosko family words uh, in, the, in the New Testament Greek. Gnosko mean we know, and then I know is Gnosko, the root word. But these last two here are epi, Gnosomai and epi Gnosim. The epi in front of it adds a time-related component. So what this is saying is up at the top, it's saying that we know something, but down at the bottom, it is saying that there's a point of time that this process produces a kind of fulfillment, and we know something. So eternal life is time-related, but it is engaging the knowledge of God. And because there is a time component in it, it is a process. And that's why everybody here has a, a story about how they know God. And everybody's story can and should be different next month and next year. Because this knowledge of God is a process. Now, why is that important? Because a lot of people live in a Christian theology, and they... they, they think about Christian theology in such a way that the idea, if you ask them, do you know God, they will refer back to a point of time when something happened, when they either prayed the sinner's prayer or they felt convicted and surrendered to that, or somebody made an altar call and they came up front, or they got catechismed or baptized or something along those lines. And I'm not saying that those events aren't significant, but I'm saying they sell short, very short, the concept of knowing God. Knowing God is a dynamic face-to-face -face relationship. And it is a relationship that leads to points in time where, oh, wow, I know. Just like it does with people. You can have a casual acquaintance. I remember when I met Vicki, uh, I met her at a, uh, going away par or a, a college going away party at uh, Betsy's house, Betsy MacArthur later. And... Uh, and man, I was struck, you know, I was struck. I even, uh, I, I was not very aggressive dater when I was young, but I remember driving home and I told my friend, I go, man, I wish I could have seen her at the end. I was going to give her a kiss. He goes, what? <laughs> that was like completely out of my character. And, uh, but, but there was that time, you know, there, time had collapsed around us meeting each other. And then we went out and then time really collapsed because 90 days after we met, we were married. And, uh, and so we've been married for a few years now. A few. Um, so that's what epigonosco means. Now, I've heard epigonosco talk that it's experiential, and that's true, but that's because it's rooted in the pathway of time, that you have an experience that you can mark a date to. And so it's not just uh, like structurally um, experiential. It's relationally very experiential. And I think the reason I didn't understand this before was I thought everything was structural and transactional. I didn't know anything was relational. I mean, I knew, I felt like I had a relationship with God. But when somebody asked me, did I know God, I wasn't looking inside and saying, am I walking with him? Can I hear his voice? Is he leading me? I was saying, when did I pray? And do I still believe what I prayed? And it's a totally different ballgame. So that's what the epi adds to the, to the Gnosko word. Okay, so the objective of knowing God is to be fully known. So now, how many of you ever ask yourself the question, am I fully known by God? Am I fully seen by him and recognized by him and known by him? Because if you don't ask that question, I think you should. Because that is, that is one of the primary objectives here. We're going to look at the end of John chapter 17 next, and, and Jesus defines the end of all that praying and his hopes for all of us that believe on them through their word and everything by a relational thing in time. That they would be one as we're one and they would know. So here's that one. This is at the end of John 17 where he started by saying this is eternal life, that they would know God. O righteous Father, although the world has not known you, yet I have known you. And these have known that you sent me. And I have made your name known to them and will make it known so that the love with which you love me may be in them and I in them. Now that last line is pretty special. I am going to do some nerd Greek 
on the next slide, but I don't want you to lose touch of the last line because it's the, it's the keeper. We're known, and eternal life is so, think about this, so that the love with which you loved me, Jesus is saying this to his Father, may be in them and die in them. I could line up 100 people who are fairly devout Christians, serious Christians. And if I were to probe their thoughts about their relationship with God and God's with them, I don't think very many of them would say, you know what, the, the love that God loves me with, the measure of that love, the nature of that love, the standard of that love, it is the exact same love that he has for his son for all eternity. And the, the reason I know that that's not the way most people think is because you can talk to them at various difficult or strategic parts of their life and, and how God loves them will be in question. They'll be going, hmm, I wonder if this thing that didn't happen means that there's something wrong with me or there's something wrong with him or this love is backing out. And uh, <laughs> that's good. Ronnie's got a sign up there. Jesus knows me, this I love. <laughs> Amen. So this is super critical, I think, because this is the, the end of this prayer. Jesus is laying out without ambiguity what he is wanting for us and what he is providing for us. Plus, then there's, a, there's another one. O righteous Father, although the world has not known you, yet I have known you, and these have known that you sent me. And I have made your name known to them, and will make it known. So that, and we're going to go back and look at those others in just a bit, but so that the love with which you loved me may be in them and I in them. So, if you're a Christian in this room or on Zoom tonight, I can declare to you that the nature of God's love for you is unqualified and unconditional and is exactly the same love that flows back and forth in the Trinity between the Father and the Son and the Spirit. Same love. I even asked the Lord about it one time when I started to try to understand this. And, uh, and I said, is that, is, is, am I thinking right about that? Can that possibly be real? That if I were to go all the way back prehistory and somehow be able to step in and observe the dynamic of the relationship between you, Father, and the Word or your Son, that that dynamic between the two of you would be like, in kind, and in substance, the way you feel about me, and you invite me to participate with you. And he said, well, yeah. He said, I don't have another love. I only have this love because I am love. I don't have a lesser love to give you. So I've been wrestling with that for a lot of years. But I believe it's true. I don't have another kind of love. Okay, so here's the Greek. Okay, now this is a, a, a little bit more challenging, but I'm not going to go too deep into this. <clears throat> so these first few knowns are all the egno, which is a part of gnosko. Okay, so... Uh, the world has not known gnoskod, but the word is egno. Uh, it's, a, it's a verb tense of it. Uh, yet I have known, Jesus is saying, so you see it's the same way. The thing the world doesn't know, Jesus does know. Egno, egnon. Uh, no sin, and these have known, so he's talking about the disciples. And here's why. Because I have made known. Now we come into a different word. It's still in the gnosko family, but it's Egnorisa, it's the norizo word, and it has a, a declaration component to it. The gnosko word is to know by observation. The epigenosko fixes a point in time where that observation is a, is a personal experience. But gnosko means to know, and, and you, can know, well, uh, you can know by observing something. The parallel word, yada, in, um, in the Old Testament, it says that Noah knew that the waters were abated. Not, not because he could see, because all he saw was water around him, but because he could see the olive leaf in the beak of the dove, and he discerned from that. So you, 
This gnosko is not some kind of mystical, magical. It's the knowledge of encountering God, experiencing God, having uh, learned something from him of scripture, having an experience, seeing something beautiful that reminds you, and all of a sudden these things start adding together. Epigonosco answers an experiential thing to that or adds an experiential thing to that. But these uh, norizo adds a declaration. And so it made me think about in Romans where it says, how shall they believe unless someone uh, speaks or declares? Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the, the revealed word of Jesus. Now that's rhema. It's not the same thing, but this is the principle behind it. That knowledge can be declared and then it can be received and engaged in and interacted in. And so what Jesus is saying here is that the world hasn't known gnosko. They haven't observed. They haven't drawn the conclusion. They haven't looked at it. But I know. And these have known because... And then let's look at the next slide. I have made your name, Father, known to them and will make it known. So... This adds not only a love component, but a why component, the way. How does love get to us? How does knowledge get to us? Jesus declares it. Jesus came to say, Father, it's like this. When you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And so the thing that we learn, I have made your name known to them and will make it known. Um, C. Baxter Kruger, just as a very short aside, C. Baxter Kruger focuses as much on this verse as any verse in the Bible. And he says, none of us would know the Father if Jesus had not made him known. We couldn't. We could try to deduce him. We could, we could look out there, but it would never turn into a relational experiential knowledge. And since, since Jesus has made him known, we need to give weight to the fact that he says, I will make it known. That which he has done, he will do. That's why I think it's important for us to believe that every single person out there can hear the revelation of God, can know it. We don't need to put ourselves in a position of, well, is this person ready? Is that person ready? Is this person called? Is that person called? Are they elect? Are they not elect? Is this the right time? We need to trust that Jesus will make the Father known. He will make his name known. And once we get that settled in our heart, it takes a lot of pressure off trying to figure out how to evangelize. You just talk to people about Jesus. You show them Jesus. You point to Jesus. And Jesus will make the fathers known. So, the way and the truth of knowing God. Being in love. Father, that you would love them. I want them to know you. I want them to experience eternal life so that you can love them with the same love you've loved me with forever. And there's other things that apply to that because God is consistent in that way. Uh, the glory, Christ in us, the hope of glory, it's the same glory that Jesus is getting back. That's why Paul can say creation was subject to futility, not of its own will, but for the revelation of the glory of the sons of God. When God made Adam and Eve, when he initiated this project, he did so to draw them into his love and to share that love with them forever. And when that got sidetracked, he was willing to put a halt on almost everything to make room for us to come to this point where we know God. Okay? So, what is your knowing God story? So, Zoomers, uh, we've got you guys up on TV. Everybody can see and hear you. I'd like to hear your stories about, about what you know. Now, the reason that I'm trying to do this on the first one, because there's a ton of stuff in there that may need to be taught. There's a lot more with the Hebrew and Greek words, I think, which can create some illumination into this idea of knowing. And there's beautiful examples of knowing um, throughout the Scripture that, that probably we should get into. But I didn't want to go too far tonight because I wanted to hear your story. I want you to verbalize it. Because... It's you that knows God through your story. And 
and all of our stories are super valuable, I think. I think they're critically valuable. So you can either go to the mic and stand there, or you can come up here and you can sit. I'll move this to the side, and I'll move that down, and I'll act like an MC or something. Now, you Zoomers can't come and sit down, so you're going to have to just raise a ruckus on Zoom and get my attention, and then we want to hear your story. So to make sure that that's going to work, how about we start with a Zoomer? Anybody up there got their story that they would like to tell about knowing God? Hey, Larry, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I just need to get clear on this. Um, okay. So are you looking for like a, a testimony of, of the progression of coming to know God? Or are you looking for, you know, like for me, my understanding of what it means to know God has actually changed tremendously even in the last few years. So even like my understanding of what, you know, doctrinally, like what you talked about tonight, for instance, to me, uh, John 17, 3 I believe, I've come to believe, is actually like the Bible's version of what is the meaning of life in the most existential <laughs> Yeah, way, yeah. Which I wouldn't have said even two years ago. So could you be just... Sure, okay, let me see if I can explain a little bit more. And same thing, if you guys have questions about this, let me know, because I know this is a weird question to ask. Um, I think what I would like to hear, I mean, like that little story, Paul, about your transition, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, but what I would really like to hear is an experience knowing God. Uh, like there's some doctrinal stuff that we're going to talk about next week where it says that by this you know that you love God if you keep his commandments. But that's packed full of, of baggage that we have to unpack. Uh, what I want to know is Where's my briefcase? Sorry, Riley. <laughs> so, I, I was with the Lord this week on this, and, and um, so I felt like God asked me, what does knowing me mean to you, Larry? Maybe I should start, so I'll give you an illustration. So knowing you means seeing you in the world around me, especially in the little interactive graces and kindness, kindnesses that happen all the time in my life. Knowing you means seeing revelation and scripture unfold in layers that are connected to other layers of other scriptures. Knowing you means experience being fathered by you. Knowing you means dialogue with you in my journal and prayers and while driving and while thinking about the state of the world around me. Knowing you means being able to see uh, growth and understanding about you and to see the things and the principles and the stuff and how you see people including those that I love and how they're doing and what's being done by all that stuff to them so it was, it, it, that's kind of what I'm looking for if, if that registers at all with you uh, a way that I have experienced knowing and being known by God is Something like that. Ronnie, you want to give it a shot? Sure. Paul, does that help at all? Help? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, absolutely. Okay. All right, go, Ronnie. So last night I was part of uh, what we're calling, what we call ascensions or prayer. And um, in the middle of it, the person that was leading said, it seems like Father God's giving everybody gifts. I want everybody to say what kind of gift you got. And that was challenging for me because it's like, okay, this is like an expectation. I didn't have an expectancy, but I had an expectation. And uh, all of a sudden in my mind, there was the word bicycle. And I was like, okay. <laughs> so I have no idea what to do with the bicycle, but I said to the group, well, it looks like I've been given a bicycle. And that started a journey that everybody was part of. And all the stuff happened with the bicycle Joy was part of being the bicycle. It was a two tandem bicycle. Joy, the being or the person of joy was throwing out water balloons with different colors and it went on and on and on. But it all started with a bicycle that I thought had nothing to do with except a word that came to my head. Sure. 
And at the end, when I was leaving, I was thanking God for the new level of communication with him and thanking him for bringing lots of pieces together about I can have an expectancy that God's going to give me something when that thing happens and not be afraid of expecting something to happen that I don't know if it's going to happen or not. So that for me is a new way of knowing God that I really like. Sure. Praise God. That's good. That's good. Okay. So doesn't that seem like a part of life that will go on forever? Because think about this. We're finite and God's infinite. That means that we can always carry expectancy. This one thing you just mentioned, Ronnie, is one of the things that blew up my old expectation about heaven. Because I didn't realize it. I'd just been taught all my life and led to believe that, that uh, when I died and went to heaven, that all of a sudden I was going to be perfect and that everything was going to be known. And, and it wasn't until I was quite a ways into my adulthood that I realized how absolutely boring it would be to live in a place where you knew everything if there wasn't stuff to explore and relationship to have. I think God's not bored because he has a chance to see life through us and he can experience it fresh and new, but it's this kind of dialogue with expectancy. So, Anybody in the room want to give it or we got another Zoomer ready? I'm happy to give it a go. Okay, Alan. Look, it's all about relationship, and it's building that relationship. It's it's about being the bride of Christ. It's about being one with Him. It's be, about to me. It's about being not scared of being me or who He's created me to be. It's it's being bold. It's 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 actually when I say being one with Him is. One of the things is I've realised that my thoughts are his thoughts. I have the mind of Christ. So if I have the mind of Christ, his thoughts are my thoughts, my thoughts are his thoughts. You know when the carnal thoughts because of nature and character, so I can think in the two. But it's like when you start a relationship with someone, it takes time and it grows and it grows and it grows. And the only time a relationship will stop when someone actually puts doesn't want to be there anymore but i believe that i dance with you know it's 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 everything that i no, am it's, mm -hmm. yeah. it's everything i am is his and i think that's the biggest thing so i walk with him i talk with him Everything I do is about who we are. I don't separate myself from him anymore. Yeah. I can't because if I did, I would just be nothing. So is there a discovery component to this idea of, oh, that's you too in me? That, uh, <laughs> this thought is, is, is discovery. It, it is. It is. It, 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 every day is exciting. Dad, what have you got for me to do today? What are you, what are you going to teach me today? Where are you taking me? Um, I talk to people and what comes out of my mouth, I know it's him because he's a lot cleverer than me. <laughs> I say, I must write this down when I get off the phone because, Dad, this is amazing. So this dialogue going here all the time, I like dialogue there. And, and one of the biggest things I was coming back from from a funeral earlier on the year and I was saying to dad I was going along and you know dad I talk too much what do you want to tell me and and that's when he, he I heard his voice I know the thoughts came into my brain I know it's him because I know his voice now I can recognize it just like when you have a relationship with your kids they can be in a crowd and you know their voice amongst the crowd mm -hmm. and that's the relationship he desires to have with us no matter what's going on whatever the storm is he's still there and he's still talking and we can hear it and we recognize it and he can guide us through that storm yeah and and you know what he said is he said he said to me he said um 
my, peop- my, my children don't do the first commandment very well. And then he said to me, but how can, you, how can you love someone with all your heart, soul and mind when you don't know them? And getting to know somebody, what are you going to do? You've got to sit with them. To You've got to spend time with them. Yeah. And it's, it's just spend time with dad. Like it can be sitting in the car. It can be times in the morning when you just, dad, I just need a bit of time with you. And you know when you need time with him because turmoil takes <laughs> The storms become real in life and you think, oh, Dad, I've just got to settle come back to you because that storm is too big for me. Yeah. And, and it's a scripture. You put scriptures in and everything. It's just a whole combination of, of having the mind of Christ. Like, it would have been amazing, Jesus walking. I just, you know, it's through endurance and encouragement of the scriptures that we have hope. So my walk with Dad has changed over the last 40 years. The first 30 years, as I said, I was trying to be a son. Now, I, the last 10 years, I am one. That was the biggest change. And I understood who I am, who he's created me to be. It's nothing to do with me. It's who he's created me to be. And then there's that journey that then goes on because I've got questions. I ask him. And sometimes you've got to wait for the answer, but sometimes he just tells you. Right. It depends where you're up to depends what you're experiencing but he walks with you mm-hmm. and it's that uh, i'm not trying to prove that god's real anymore i'm not trying to prove that i'm a son of god i am one and he loves us as you say brother the, the biggest thing is his love like to be loved by somebody the extent that he loves us and to understand that you know my people perish for lack of knowledge because they don't understand how much he loves us and wants to be one with us and wants to like i used to think i could hide things from god <laughs> now i'm just bare dad you know my weaknesses you know my thoughts mm-hmm. give them to you and you know what it's never a problem amen amen you know, as you guys, as you listen to Alan's uh, testimony, um, just grab Mike and come on up or whatever. As you listen to Alan's testimony, and Alan, as I, I hear you talking, I can't help but go, well, this is scripture coming alive. You know, Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice, and they won't follow the voice of a stranger. I know my own, and they know me. And this is just what you're talking about. And I can see your life, the way you're experiencing it now, being a satisfying life to continue to grow in after you die, are resurrected, and are living in the eternal thing. It's not ever going to get old. And, and, and we have the advantage that God's infinite we're finite. Even then, after we're raised from the dead, we're still finite. There's still boundaries that, that God's going to be able to release to us to explore about our relationship with him, about his love, about all that, and about other people around us, about creation, about the cosmos, about the stars, about the spiritual realm. It's just like a wide open deal. I really love it. You want to sit up here or you want to stand there? Yeah, grab the mic there, right by you. Yeah, just bring it with you. Excellent, Alan. Thanks, man. We had an interesting experience last night. We met with a couple that didn't have a church background. And they uh, were in crisis. And so we were talking about laying down kind of the guidelines for um, how we handle mentoring. And um, about halfway through our conversation, Tim asked them, uh, are you born again? Have you ever, you know, what's your experience with the Lord? And they both, um, you know, acknowledged that they didn't know him. And so uh, we prayed with them and, uh, you know, continue then to just kind of pour into them. And the breakthrough that I saw with her, because she was really hurting and she had really shut down. And so how do you know when you're reaching that person? And I looked at them and, and it wasn't even me. I mean, most of what Tim and I experienced last night was not us. We were just kind of sitting there and the Lord was speaking through us because, you know, we're not counselors. We just want to do what God calls us to do. Anyway, um, I said to them, I looked them in the eye and I said, God accepts you where you're at. He loves you just the way you are. 
and there was a breakthrough, an amazing breakthrough on both of them. I mean, they just, wow, God, God of the universe actually loves me. I mean, it was just, it was what a revelation. Huh? Yeah, it was, it was profound. It was, it was amazing. So That's anyway, really awesome. so for us, knowing God is one thing, but being able to share who God is with somebody else and see that light come on in their eyes is, I mean, it's priceless. So I would say this, we need to start getting used to recognizing Jesus working around us and also especially in us. So when he says up there, Father, I have made your name known to them, and I will, I think that's what you experienced. You experienced Jesus's I will make it known happening just through you guys extending kindness and being a part of that. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Praise God. That's, that's really awesome. That's really awesome. Anybody else? Paul, give it a shot. Let me give it a shot? Yeah. Well, just uh, experientially, you know, as, as you know, personally, because of our conversations, the last few years for me have been a, a, a rather intensive and, and uh, extensive time spent learning about union and Trinitarian love and true identity and the perfect love of the Father. And what's become clear to me in the process is that, again, as I mentioned earlier, I, I have come to believe that, that John 17, 3 is the Bible's way of saying this is the meaning of life. This is, this, this is the, this answers the existential question that, you know, philosophers have tried to answer for, uh, millennia. Anyway, because, you know, you use the word, uh, was it Genosco? Mm -hmm. Um, you know, that word is used many times in, in scripture, but it's the one that the Lord had me focus in on was in John 10, I think verses 14 and 15, mm -hmm. where Jesus said, I know my own and my own know me, even as the Father knows me, I know the Father. So what that verse for me does is it actually then sets context to John 17, 3. You know, in a sense, John 17, 3, and, and, and I like the way you got into it. I like the way. But, you know, I read that verse for years, a couple of decades, and just blew past it. Um, I, I just took it in the most vague and general way. But now I look at that verse and I say, this is eternity. This is endless life. This is the meaning of being that for all eternity, all eternity, we are going to have the experience of coming into a knowledge of the, of the, you know, of God as Father and Jesus as King, Savior and Big Brother, and it's going to unfold. But the, but we can have an expectation that the intimacy level is going to be as authentic as that which exists within the Trinity. Amen. And if we can't find like our, the meaning of life in that, if we can't find identity in that, if we can't, like, if that can't be like basically the highest truth of our lives, I simply don't know what else would be. Yeah. Um, so that's where every part of my, my being has gone in terms of, and, and this is what, just to add one more thing to it, this is why I'm so grateful for the teaching on union the Lord's been doing in my heart for the last four or five years. Because having that settled in my heart allowed my faith and even my natural mind to recognize that this, what Jesus was saying wasn't too fantastic. That it's actually the structure is already in place. Right. Right. And and we can live in it now. And if I had time, I'd tell you about my birthday experience with the Lord, um, which was kind of the most out of body, glorified kind of Second Corinthians twelve, you know, where my third heaven kind of deal. But the thing I took away from all of it, the bottom line from that experience was, we can live in that now. Not only look forward to an eternity, but we can. Lay hold, we could take ownership of that because, again, the structure for that already exists in perfect union. Right.
Right. And, you know, uh, something, Paul, that just stirred in me when you said that structure. When I'm saying that the life we live now in this, we can experience in, in, uh, forever and it not grow boring and not grow old. Uh, that structure also allows us to live in relationship to, but independent of, or not in a need-based dependence on the creation. Because that relationship didn't come from creation. Creation came from that relationship. Mm -hmm. So the father and son had this perfect relationship of love and knowing one another, deep intimate knowledge, going back and forth. And from that, creation came out to make room for it, to make mm -hmm. room for it in beauty, to make room for it in song, to make room for it in science, to make room for it in, uh, in anthropology and cosmology. And so considering the new heaven and the new earth, I don't think any of this exploration, bye-bye, Jen, I, I don't think any of this, ex, uh, this uh, exploration that we're doing now is going to go away. I just think it's going to be enhanced and satisfying. Again, because the structure is sufficient to bear it. Yeah, and one more thing just to consider. Again, you know, for me personally, was, you know, I think as believers, we always want to think that our relationship with God is is as pure as it can be, especially when it comes to our motivation. You know, this idea, well, God, you're enough and you're all I need. But as the Lord has pointed out to me, there's been so much, such a, 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 a such a tremendous aspect of my life, my relationship with him, where all kind of my baggage has been carried along. You know, no matter how great a time I'm having with God, at the end, they're always, oh, by the way, God, you should put some money in my checking account, or oh, by the way, God, you know, my, my sister's sick, could you heal her? You know, it's hard to like see this thing as stand alone. We, we, you know, life kind of always filters into it. And that's fine. And I think that's, I mean, that's life. We're human. That's, you know, we've got to meet our needs. But with the revelation that I've been, you know, kind of growing in lately and, and just the reality of what it means to be in perfect union with that, that kind of Trinitarian love, it, it has allowed me to recognize that, that simply by by allowing myself the freedom to let that be exactly what it is, kind of like the, the highest purpose of being, it's put all other needs in perspective. Mm -hmm. And and I've come to recognize that, you know, because sometimes I feel if I'm not praying about needs or circumstances or what other people need, I might be an irresponsible or a bad Christian. And of course, we are called to serve, and, we, and that takes many forms. But there is something about recognizing our highest call and truest purpose in this kind of this love with God mm -hmm. that puts all that in perspective. And when we know that, that place of love, things like faith come so much easier. Faith truly does work by love. So it's not like, you know, because sometimes I feel like I'm being irresponsible, like spending that much time with God just focused on his beauty and love and communion and intimacy. But I've come to realize that actually, if I really do care about these other things, and I do, that that's the, that's the, at least strategically, it's still the best thing I can be doing. Yeah, it is. Time with him. It is. You know, that, that sort of uh, rule type verse that I mentioned earlier, that uh, um, by this you'll know that you love God if you keep his commandments, that can either be placed as a rule or it can be a part of the experience of union and love. And it's right. a totally different thing. A totally different thing. I think we're going to see that. So it's it's one minute after eight. I'd I'd like to give it about ten more minutes, and that would give us room for for two or maybe three more uh, of you to share. What does it mean to uh, know God for you? Yeah, come on, Jim. Yeah, praise God. I, I believe for me, um, we were discussing some of this on Tuesday night mm -hmm. at the Bible study, but for me it's been a process or a journey um, that really kind of accumulated more, I would say, in the last four or five years. Um, some of your teaching changed because of mm -hmm. influence that you had, and you always were involved with our Bible study on Wednesday, and mm -hmm. so we would hear Larry's sermons and we would discuss it in the Bible study. 
and you were introducing us to people like you know uh, Kruger and Moeller and um, you know Paul Young and all these people and, and it definitely um, set a new tone and then you know Meg and I became a part of Global Ascension Network uh, with Ascensions and working with Nancy and her group and and you've been involved with that and so we have a couple of sessions during the week that are Joyland and one that's uh, with Nancy's group uh, with Gain and just the whole experience of knowing God on mm -hmm. a different level um, has really changed like it's like going from religion to faith teaching to complete growth mm -hmm. you know it feels like a promotion each time and um, and, and I just love the fact that, you know, I had a different uh, view of the father, you know, because of my own father was a strict disciplinarian, very kind of harsh. And I thought God was the same way, you know. We've often joked about the fact, Meg says squash like a bug, I say squash like a grape. I, I, I thought that's what he would do if I didn't He wants perform. to get a little communion out of it. <laughs> <laughs> but... You know, I don't feel that way about the Father at all. I know he's real loving. He's very forgiving. And um, if I didn't feel that way, then Jesus wouldn't have paid the price for me that he did. And and that's been an awesome experience. And to me, like the, the cherry on the Sunday, if you will, spiritually speaking, too, uh, was last night, like what Meg was to say, and, you know, to meet with this couple. And, and, and I just knew I was to ask him, do you, do you even know the Lord? No, mm -hmm. you know. Do you have a Bible? He didn't have a Bible. And to be able to ask that and it be okay yeah. when they answer it that yeah. way. Not yeah. not to all of a sudden feel like some kind of obligation kicks yeah. in to do more than to be in Christ, yeah. in love. It's just like what Meg was saying. It's almost wasn't like us speaking. It was like the Holy Spirit using us to speak to them. And there was tears and, you know, the, it was just a wonderful experience. We asked, do you have a Bible? And she had a precious moments Bible. Now, this couple's probably in their 30s, and that's the only Bible that she had, you Praise know. God. And so we encouraged them to buy, buy a Bible, and, of course, we gave them some assignments about reading the Bible and praying together. Mm -hmm. But it was just awesome when they, we prayed with them. They received the Lord. You know, we were all holding hands, and there was lots of tears, and, and it was a neat acceptance. And that hasn't happened for a while. Mm -hmm. We get to lead somebody to the Lord. So mm -hmm. to have two people and a couple, that was awesome. That's precious. Yeah. That's wonderful. Yeah. That's great. That's great. Okay, anybody else? Uh, or online, anybody want to share? Yeah, Tess, go ahead. Um, I hesitate sometimes to explain it because my my growth relationship with the Lord didn't come through getting saved and then going to church and doing all that. I had an encounter with him as a toddler at three years old, and it lasted continuously for some years where I sat in his lap face to face in the spirit room. Um, and so as a three year old. As a three-year-old, four-year-old, on yeah. into my first grade, second grade. And it wasn't until I shared that experience with someone who happened to be the daughter of a pastor of the church down the road that she attempted to tell me what I was experiencing and that I needed to go to church. And as Lynn Hiles is often quoted to say, I went to church and became an unbeliever um, because there was all this legalism and, and constraints that couldn't relate to what I had experienced. And I was, um, I was a compliant child. And so it was my nature to submit to authority. And so when there were people in authority telling me that what I experienced couldn't be real because their interpretation and understanding of what the, the Bible said 
was at odds with what I had experienced, I began to allow them to change my mind about what I experienced. And it wasn't until much later that I realized that I had been hijacked, mm -hmm. basically. And I went through a period of time where I was very angry with God as a father, because to me, that's what he had been was a father. Um, that I was angry with him for allowing that to happen, especially from people who claim to know him and, you know, carry his name. And I didn't understand how he, I, I identified, resonated with that statement you made earlier about things happening where you go, okay, I must have done something that so displeased him mm -hmm. that he would do this to me, you know, kind of thing. And, um, and, and the whole thing was that I, um, there was a, a period of time I came back. I mean, once you know him, that you know him, that you know him, nothing else compares. Right. It really doesn't. And so I kept coming back, but I kept getting disappointed because religion had him in this box that just didn't fit with what I, I knew of him. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so I would continuously leave. Well, it turned out over the course of, you know, the past 30, 40 years that I've come to understand some of what's going on, but I lost a lot of that, what I called the naive intimacy and trust that a child has for a relationship. I lost a lot of that. And then when I started embracing, you know, that the, um, the Lord Jesus Christ and, and that whole understanding of, of it all, um, I had a really hard time with, with, I separated father was this, Jesus Christ was this. Mm -hmm. I knew that they were one, but one of them I was mad at all the time because he betrayed me and left me, you know, hanging. And the other one, I didn't quite trust fully enough to, um, to let that happen again, really is what happened. But it's sort of, it's sort of interesting. Somebody said earlier about how, I think it was Al mentioned, you know, that his relationship grew and, and changed and all this. And I can see in my relationship, even though it's not where I would like it to be, because I used to converse with him all the time. I heard him talk back to me. I, I literally, in some ways, it was like I had this imaginary friend and we had real conversations. He would tell me real things and re revelation and, you know, all this really neat stuff. Um, but I lost the understanding of how it had anything to do with my practical everyday life, getting jobs, um, you know, making money, whatever, the, doing a business, um, making friends, whatever the case may be, I just lost the whole, the whole thing. And I, I had a thought some time ago that what happened was as a child, I related so innocently with the God, with God, but I never could adjust that change that happens when you're even when you're growing up as a child in your home and you relate differently mm -hmm. to your parents as a child than you do as a teenager than you do as a young adult that you do once you marry and have your own kids etc i never was able to make that leap because of of a perceived betrayal back at this point. Okay. And, and, um, I remember. Let, me ask, you, let me ask you a question. Yeah. Are, you still, are you still at that place or has something happened that's gotten you beyond that? No, I feel like I'm still, I still have walls up. Mm -hmm. Um, 
Although Bill Johnson did chastise me through a, a word he said, he brought up a scripture, something about uh, blessed are those that are be not offended at God. In me, yeah. Or in me, yeah. yeah. And I, I, I mean, I wept for days just going, God, I'm offended, <laughs> you know, but I don't know what to do about it, you know. Let, let me uh, just tell you what's come to mind. Um, because Jesus is the same today, yesterday, and forever. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the true understanding of the unchangeableness of God is that he, he can adapt, he can work with us, he can move, but he doesn't throw away his character and become untrustworthy or something like that, like you were tempted to think. I would refer you to the letter to the church of Ephesus. And I think, isn't that the one that says, I have this against you, return to mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Just meditate on that a little while. And, and then because there is this relationship, because you're in relationship with God, you can very easily say, Lord, I can read this and I can try to do what, what Pastor Larry is suggesting, but you know and I know I can't do this without your help. Mm -hmm. So will you help me? Will you help me return to my first love? Because you have a right to that place before the Father. Mm -hmm. that you had when you were three and four years old. And I certainly apologize that the, the church, uh, probably unknowingly and out of their own insecurity, our own insecurity, that they took that from you, but they don't have the right to keep it from you. And, and I understand that. I mean, you know, I, there's, I, no I reason to, there's no reason to hang on to that. So I, right. I'd go there and I'll be praying with you about, about that return to your first love thing. Well, I feel like it, uh, I guess some of the things that cause me to get frustrated about it, you know, it'd be real easy just to turn cold and, you know, forget, but I continue to harbor a conviction that he didn't make himself known to me for no reason. That's right. And I refuse, I'm saying this outright in front of everybody. I refuse to live out my life not having fulfilled what it was he saw in me to yeah. call me at that age. Yeah. Well, we'll agree with you. And then I would only suggest one correction to anything you've said. It's not that easy to throw away God once you have a relationship with him. It seems easy. It's super tempting when it's frustrating. But he'll 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 stay with you and after you. So yeah. we're gonna be praying with you. That's good. Thanks for the courage of that of that testimony too. Well, I just I I guess when I say I I hesitate to say it is because I don't want to come off as saying I've had an experience and you don't know what it's like. You know that's not the way it is. It I don't even know why, other than I had two godly grandmothers who were praying for me. I don't even know why. He, you know, elected to do that. Mm -hmm. I just know that there has to be something more to it than just leaving me there. Yeah, you absolutely. Know? I think part of it too, just think about this. It's rooted in that thing that Jesus said, Father, so that you could love them with the exact mm -hmm. same love you love me with. Mm -hmm. so, praise God. All right, it's 816. We probably ought to wrap up. But thank you for sharing. This won't be the last time. I want you guys, when I send out those things and say, come ready to share, I appreciate that you guys were. Mm -hmm. uh, this idea of knowing God is, um, let's just, you know, if we walk away with nothing from tonight except this, Jesus said, this is eternal life, that they would know you, the only true God, and Jesus whom you sent. And no matter how uh, glorious, no matter how spiritual, no matter how mundane, not even, even no matter how religious your knowledge of God has been, it is a taste of eternal life. It is part of the substance of, of forever in our lives that God has given us. So this won't be the last time we're going to share these stories. I'm going to talk about some of these details a little bit in the next couple of weeks. And then we're going to revisit the, the stuff I talked about two weeks ago about who is God, that God is light, and God is spirit, and God is fire, and God is love, love. And, and it's going to add an importance to knowing that, because where have we seen spirit impact our lives? Not, not to be spiritual as like a distant goal, but this part of the interface between us and God. 
Or when has light come into our life? And there's so many scriptures. I mean, that famous prophetic scripture in Isaiah chapter 60, Arise and shine for your light has come. That's not a light shining from outer space someplace. That's God who is light, and in him is no darkness at all. So it's no wonder that with him rising in us, the darkness is, is um, conquerable in the deep darkness. So anyway, we're going to get into that. But thank you very much. Everybody that shared, those of you, just be pondering those things in your life. Uh, what are your experiences knowing God? And Holy Spirit, um, Jesus said that you were going to bring to mind all that he did. And a lot of what Jesus has done is to reveal the Father to us. And he made a promise to us. You made that promise. You said that uh, in that day, and I believe with all my heart that we're living in that day, that day after the Spirit has been outpoured, that day after you have uh, obliterated sin as an issue once for all, that day after you've poured out your blood on the heavenly tabernacle, the heavenly altar in that tabernacle not made with hands, in that day we're going to know that you're in, in your Father, and that's a good place for us to start meditating. So Holy Spirit, show us what the dynamic life, like Paul talked about, what is that life that exists and has existed before creation between the Father and the Son. And is that the life that we are being invited into? Is that is knowing the Father the way the Son knows Him and knowing the Son the way the Father knows Him in the Spirit, is that the promise of eternal life? And I, and I believe it is. And so just work with us this week. Bring this to mind. Help us even recognize an eternal life experience of knowing God that you bring to our life this week. And we love you. We know we'll grow by it. And uh, we have plenty of occasion throughout the week to talk to one another and, and uh, testify to these things. But open our eyes to them, Lord, I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Bless Amen. all of you. Amen. That was wonderful. Amen. Thank hey, you. Larry. Yes, who's talking? Me, Ronnie. Hey, Ronnie. You know that first scripture that you showed on the Prometheus Prometheum board? Uh huh. There, the line before the line that you're focused on was pretty important to me, and I didn't notice it until tonight. That Jesus is the one that does the knowing, and it will spread the knowing. Therefore, we don't even need to work at trying to know. Right. He, he does it. It falls back into what we've learned in the New Covenant, that Jesus is the centerpiece of that. And if we'll, We will not make a mistake. Or the way Baxter Kruger puts it, he says, here's something you'll never hear in heaven. Wow, Jesus, we really overestimated the role you play in eternity. <laughs> this is not going to happen. God bless you guys. Have a good night. Thanks, Larry. All right. Bye-bye. And God bless you guys.